Hello everyone. I'm truly sorry about the technical difficulties we're having over there on YouTube. So just so that we can do this together, I really want to make it um, a point to be able to do this together. Um, so if you don't mind, um, if you are watching this today, would you please um, share this on your page and those that are in um, um, those of us who are in the Facebook a group for Fisher's Point, if you would please share that into the Facebook group. So uh, once again, very sorry that uh, that uh, this was happening, but I wanted to make sure this was meaningful for everybody. And for some reason, YouTube has not chose this time not to work on me. So uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to go ahead and do what uh, we need to be doing here in, in a time of reflection, in a time of, of, you know, a lot of the world is going through fear right now. This is not an uncommon thing for the world to be embraced by fear. And the, one of the things um, that I've realized is that the more and more uh, we lean into fear, the farther and farther we get uh, from God and his blessings for us. So, um, I think today what we need to be doing is reflecting on this sacrifice um, that, that we think about during this time of year. Now, um, if, if you have gotten the communication from us, um, once again, I ask that you share this on your personal Facebook page. Also share it into the um, Facebook group um, for Fisher's Point, for those of you who are a part of that. And if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to have you a part of that. So um, I just wanted to uh, be able to welcome you, first of all, to our very first Good Friday online communion service. Um, starts out with a little bit of uh, frustration on my part. Now, I know as a pastor, these things happen and I have to calm it down and have to kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, back up a little bit and make sure um, that that I am centered for this type of event. Now, another thing is we're going to go ahead and copy this and, and make this into a YouTube video and put it out there for people to see who may not have Facebook. So I wanted that to be um, meaningful uh, for everybody. So for um, for today, I thought it would be very interesting for us to first read uh, some of this passage, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to be reading from, um, uh, from verse uh, 1 all the way to 17. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and skip down to 7. I'm going to go ahead and skip down to verse 7. 7 through 16, actually. And one of the things that I wanted to mention here today is that we are in the context here of, of the Last Supper. You know, you kind of know what's coming when we talk about communion, and maybe if that, that is something you have celebrated in your own life, um, in your own church that you've gone to, if you don't come to Fisher's Point, um, wherever you are from, we're absolutely grateful for you to be here. But one of the things that we are celebrating here is not only the Last Supper, but we're also celebrating for our Jewish friends here the Passover. And if you've read anything about the Passover, we find that in the book of Exodus. And in this in this story, you know, Moses is is approaching Pharaoh multiple times. Will you let my people go? You see, the Israelite people were captive slaves in Egypt. And the Pharaoh was very stubborn. He wouldn't let them go because if you think about it, they were the uh, one of the central points of their economy. Their economy would have crashed if he would have let all of the slaves go. Think about all the labor. Think about all of the things in the households and in, in the palace and all of that that these Israelites were doing. So Moses approached him. These people were God's people. They weren't going to be enslaved. And God meant for us to be free. So um, Moses went to Pharaoh time after time after time. And every time Pharaoh said no, yet another plague was brought on him. So when we are 
dealing with Pharaoh here, we're also dealing with the consequences of his sin. Moses, on the last time, warned Pharaoh, Hey, Pharaoh, if you do not um, let my people go, God will bring in the angel of death, and all of your firstborn will be destroyed. What God told Moses was this, The angel of death will come through, but you will be rescued if your house has the blood of the lamb on the, on the doorposts. So the angel would go by, see the blood, and, the, and then he would then move on. For the, those that didn't have the blood, then we see the inevitable conclusion there. The point that we see here in this particular context is that the blood of the lamb equaled rescue. There had to be blood shed in order for rescue to happen. Blood often reminds us, and we think, oh, you know, blood, you know, that doesn't feel good. That, it's not a great thing to talk about. But blood is a symbol, is a symbolic, uh, it's a symbol of death. It's a symbol of darkness. Symbol of suffering. It's a symbol of pain. And to think that this particular story that we're about to read happened on Passover, we are making a direct connection between that blood of the Lamb and rescue and what is about to happen in the life of Jesus in his ministry. You see, the cross, what we see here later on, here in just a moment, the cross, while it also symbolizes death, it symbolizes rescue. It symbolizes renewal. It symbolizes all of these things that we cherish. But the point was, we have a, a second part of the story coming on Sunday, and I won't spoil that for you. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and read. So if, if you can imagine, the Jewish people, they would gather around and recline at tables. They didn't have like uh, chairs that we sit in, or they didn't normally use them for something like this. They would recline on one another. You can imagine just the back slapping, the, you know, you know, razzing each other, j just being a family and friends. And this is what the context of the disciples was in this particular Last Supper. So we have this story in this context that they're already thinking about blood, rescue, free from captivity. And here's what happened in Luke chapter 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asked, Where is the guest room? Where, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large open room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to stop right there. So we're getting set up here. And you can imagine that the Passover, it's something they do every year. But when Jesus says, it's a very weird situation that's going on here. He says, go on to this place. And follow this guy into his house. How many of you are wanting to do that today? Just go follow someone on the street and then just follow them right into their home. Well, we got the social distancing thing, so that wouldn't happen anyway. But in any other normal circumstance, that would be considered an intrusion. And it would not be appropriate. But in this particular context, there was already preparations. 
Jesus had prepared, this man had prepared. The disciples were coming in fresh and new. And then Jesus sits down and he starts to talk about the Passover. And in the Passover, they had many different things that they would say, that, uh, many different things that they would talk about. And it, it was actually a scripted thing uh, full of uh, prayers and responsive readings and um, psalms and all of that, this, this type of wonderful stuff. And... Uh, they are doing this, when they are doing this, Jesus says, hey, I, I'm really excited to eat this Passover with you right before I suffer. Could you imagine stepping back and thinking, what, what is he talking about, about to suffer? Judas may have had an idea, and we see later on that Judas betrays him. But then he go, But then, in order to build unity... In order to build uh, thankfulness, in order to prepare them spiritually, he gave new meaning to a normal part of this Passover, something they have done in routine every single year. So here we are. I hope that you have your, your bread or cracker or whatever you're using and your juice today um, to celebrate with us. When we celebrate uh, um the Last Supper, when we celebrate communion together, um, we are actually the calm union. It, it's actually this, it already projects this idea of togetherness. It's, we're doing it all over the world together. And when we take communion, we're not only taking it with each other, the ones that are watching here and me, but we're also taking it with everyone who is taking it and who agrees that they are disciples of Jesus Christ as well. Past, present, future. So this idea is not just, oh, okay, it's just a routine. Let's, let's talk about Jesus and how he died. Because we see something that happens here that is very different than any Passover festival or feast that they've ever had. Because their friend, their Messiah... The, the person who loves them the most is about to die. So, let's be the disciples today. Let's get ready. As a part of this Passover, Jesus took the bread. He raised it to heaven. And he blessed it. And then he, and he divided it and he um, let, let them take a piece. And he said something very interesting to them, something that didn't quite fit. And they didn't know until much later. He says, this is my body, broken for you, for the forgiveness of sin. Take and eat in remembrance of me. So they took and they ate. The thing was, later on, every time they did that, they would have been thinking about Jesus and what he said to them. After he did that, he took the cup and he raised it to heaven and he, and he blessed it and he passed it out among them. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. May it preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Take and drink, and when you do, do so in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. That was all well and good, and the disciples were probably sitting there, what is he talking about? What we see in the very next uh, chapter is something, well, in the very, towards the end of that very same chapter, is that first of all, Jesus is betrayed. Judas has already given the, the money over, or had, have received his money for, you know, telling where Jesus was. They come in, they arrest Jesus, and we see all kinds of stories, what happened, and Peter denying Jesus three times, and and uh, moving on from that, all of the immense suffering that Jesus went through. This wasn't something like they pulled the plug on life support. Jesus suffered immensely before he died. So today, 
as we have already taken communion just a moment ago. It has new meaning for us as disciples because we're not just eating it and drinking it, but we do that with this in mind. Jesus was horribly beaten, horribly tortured, ridiculed. Isaiah tells us all about it, and it's a, and it's a foreshadowing, a prophecy of the Savior who's going to come with such power that he gives up his power so that others may live. The crucifixion happens. And Jesus did not go to this... Um, to, to the cross, kicking and screaming. He wasn't fighting anyone. He knew that blood equaled rescue. That the blood of the Lamb was the only thing that could have saved the people that he loved. And yes, um, people talked about when's, when's Israel going to be restored? When are we going to get our stuff back? When are we going to finally be at peace? But Jesus says, before you're at peace, the, the suffering, the anguish, needs to go through me first. We can be sad right now because it's such darkness, such killing, such evil that is happening here in the direction of Jesus. Now, when we look today at our world and we look at the fallen nature of humanity, and when we look at the virus, when we look at poverty, when we look at all of these different things, the one thing that we can look at, even though it seems so hopeless, is that the blood of the Lamb equals rescue. Today, I don't want to put like a hopeful spin on this, but for the next few days, I want us to just kind of reflect, allow us to hurt I don't want to give you any hope right now. <laughs> I know a pastor, uh, a pastor saying that sounds very odd, doesn't it? We know hope is coming, but let's just be in the moment. What kind of things are you feeling when a great friend, a person you trusted, one that you thought was going to rescue you, is now dead, gone? The curtain has closed. The play is over. The show is not going on anymore. All of us sitting in our homes right now, and maybe if you took communion with me, I, I thank you for doing that uh, together. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, when's the good news? Well, Sunday we have the good news. But right now, together, let's acknowledge the fact that Jesus came and he died and his blood was shed for us. Let's take these next few days to think about how that would have affected the disciples and the community. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your abundant blessings. And Lord, we grieve when we know a friend has passed away. Good Friday represents something that is dark. It's horrible. But at the same time, we know that you're a God who takes those kind of things and turns them upside down. Just as at church we are talking about this concept of a story that is heading in one direction, being rewritten, we know that you're a God who rewrites dark stories. In fact, at the very beginning of creation, it's described as you are hovering over the darkness and you speak creation into existence. So we know that you're a God who, who definitely um, leans in to this idea of bringing light to darkness. But today, help us to reflect on what this sacrifice means. The blood of the Lamb equals rescue. Help us to remember that today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. Um, I'm going to try to get to uh, making sure this is on YouTube. And I appreciate your time.